Hey there. In today's show, we're going to break down common findings in blood work from a client who is vegan for over two years. This is a trend that I see in people who have been vegan or vegetarian for an extended period of time, I would say over a year. I want to share through three different laboratory findings from three different individuals who are young, premenopausal women and talk about the patterns and trends that I look at when I look at labs and compare and contrast those to omnivorous athletes that are male. And again, you can download the blood work cheat sheet over at highintensityhealth.com. I will link that in the description below. You can send this right to your doctor when you're getting your annual physical to make sure that you're getting all three of the liver function tests, your iron, your ferritin, and some of the other biomarkers that we're going to look at today. So what do we see here? Well, first we see the hemoglobin A1C is slightly elevated. This is actually a common finding in individuals who are vegan and vegetarian because the perception is if it's plant-based, it must be healthy. Well, some of the most unhealthy foods that are available at fast food restaurants, at Whole Foods, at you fill in the blank, happen to be vegan. We're talking about donuts, bread, pastries, sugar, Pepsi. I mean, there's this next burger. I can share with you some images on the screen right here from a prominent vegan activist who is promoting individuals go to next burger. There's milkshakes, there's French fries, there's double decker burgers that are made with beyond meat. So again, the perception is that if it's plant-based, it must be healthy. But as we see here, we see a mildly elevated hemoglobin A1C, which reflects on average one's 90 day glucose level. And this is slightly elevated, not alarming. But I want to go, once I see the glucose, which was non-fasted, by the way, uh, this individual prior to this test a few hours before had what she normally has, has in the morning, which is a matcha drink with a little bit of almond milk or nut milk, sometimes some heavy whipping cream from dairy. So she's transitioning away or more towards an omnivorous style diet. She also had a little bit of honey in that drink. So the glucose was 93. And then what I like to look at when I see glucose and hemoglobin A1C, as I talk about in the blood work masterclass, is then look at triglycerides. Now, I was really impressed here. The fasting or somewhat non-fasted triglycerides were only 50. So this reflects to me that she's possibly in the early stages of insulin resistance, but it hasn't been going on for a long period of time, which is good. Then I like to look at, in addition to ApoB, which we're gonna get to, which reflects the LDL cholesterol content, the LDL and IDL, I like to look at the liver function tests, which are AST, ALT, and GGT. Unfortunately, many doctors will only run sometimes one of these, usually at least AST, but you wanna look at all three as we talk about in the Bloodwork Masterclass that I'll link below as well. So what's nice is the GGT is only 7, the AST is 11, and the AST is 18, which is good. So when individuals get more and more insulin resistant, sometimes these liver enzymes start to increase above 30, which is problematic. So that was all good. You might notice here the elevated phosphorus just at 4.4. Usually phosphorus uh, increases are a reflection of kidney disease, but I looked at another marker to ascertain whether or not there was early stage kidney issues because this individual told me that several years ago she was diagnosed with prediabetes and increased her exercise. And so thankfully there is no evidence of kidney dysfunction, but there is a mild elevation in phosphorus. So everything is looking pretty good on this outside of the fact that the hemoglobin A1C is slightly elevated. Now, here's what's actually really common amongst premenopausal vegan and vegetarian individuals is you want to look at the hemoglobin and hematocrit. And what do you see here? Well, in this individual, her hemoglobin is only 12, which is a little bit on the low side, especially because she's physically active and the hematocrit is only 35.5%. Now, this is problematic again for exercise tolerance. So she's just at the low end of the cut point, which is 34%. And you'll see in a moment how my male clients, uh, their hematocrit is north of 42%. Again, more is not better. If your hematocrit gets over 50%, that increases your risk of clotting and having a stroke and having thick, viscous blood. So on the long-term cardiovascular disease risk standpoint, it's better to have thinner blood and a hematocrit that maybe is between 42 and 45%, a hemoglobin around 15 grams per deciliter. But in this case, it's on the lower end, which is problematic for this individual because she likes to exercise, likes to hike, likes to run. And so again, this is a common finding. Now, once we see that the hematocrit is low, and the hemoglobin is low, what I like to do is go and look at the ferritin and the iron. And in fact, these are definitely on the low side, especially for a premenopausal woman. 
women that are menstruating. So you see here, her ferritin is only 58 nanograms per ml. Her iron is only 89. And so these are on the lower end. And so what this suggests to me is as she's menstruating, she's losing blood, not getting dietary or heme iron, uh, possibly B vitamins, folate and B12. And that might be contributing to exercise intolerance. And this is problematic, especially for people as they're younger, because we want to focus on building muscle mass throughout lifespan and improving exercise capacity to purge those senescent cells in our fat tissue, improve stem cell release and all of the things. So uh, my advice to this individual was twofold. I would encourage her to go on a omnivorous style diet, have more red meat based products. I know that's, you know, sort of triggering for people. But again, when you look at these labs, you can tell that there is a deficiency in iron and related B vitamins that can contribute to anemias. You also see a relatively low MCV and MCH. We're going to talk about that in just a moment from another client. In fact, right here. So this woman, she is 39 years old, uh, has had two children and you see the same trends in the hemoglobin, hematocrit, MCV, MCH. And this is actually a lot more pronounced. So you can see here, her hemoglobin is 11.6. The last client, it was just 12. Her hematocrit is 36.9. The last client was 35. Again, in people who are exercising, which should be everyone, including you, you ideally that would be around 40%. You start to notice that uh, exercise-induced breathlessness, which is not good. It means that you're not getting uh, adequate oxygen delivery to your working skeletal muscle, which is problematic. But in this case, you actually see a much lower MCV and MCH. So this is known, the acronym for MCV is mean corpuscular volume, and the MCH is mean corpuscular uh, hemoglobin, which are lower. So she is anemic. Uh, her ferritin, unfortunately, on this test, because I didn't run it for her, she was sending me these labs prior to our consult, wasn't ran, but she's tired all the time. She's fatigued. She has no energy to exercise. And you can just look at this and say, well, obviously, you, you have exercise intolerance. And again, that's problematic because we want people to start exercising when they're young to preserve skeletal muscle, to preserve that strength because we naturally lose it as we get older, as we've been focusing a lot about. Now, before we go on, friends, I just want to say thank you for being here. If you're enjoying this content, hit that like button, leave me a comment below and any questions, you know, we have our full blood work masterclass that I'll link below. We can dive further into all of these metabolic health and iron related parameters, as well as look at blood viscosity and the markers. So you have a better idea about what your blood tests and the laboratory interpretations mean for your health. That is the point here. So let's go on and look at another, yet another female client who surprise, surprise here in the Seattle area. So many people are going plant-based and vegan and we see the very similar trend. This individual is 42 years old. What do we see? A slightly higher hematocrit compared to the other two individuals, but her hemoglobin again is quite low, 11.9 uh, grams per deciliter. So just below the cut point where we would sort of diagnose a, a type of anemia. And then again, you see the low MCV, low MCH. You're starting to see the trend here, right? Now, before we go back to the first clients, uh, apolipoprotein B, insulin, and other parameters related to cardiovascular health, let's compare and contrast since we've been talking a lot about hemoglobin and hematocrit to omnivorous male clients who are athletic. Okay, so this is an individual at the time of this lab test was 34. You see the hemoglobin is 14.5. And again, he's a male. And you see the hematocrit is 42.5%. So this individual eats meat, exercises, does intermittent fasting. So as a male worried about cardiovascular health, he's right in that sweet spot where the blood is not too thick and viscous as reflected by the hematocrit being 42%, the hemoglobin at 14.5 grams per deciliter. When that creeps up over 16, 17, 18, you start to recommend donating blood and so forth. Again, as we talk about in the blood work masterclass extensively. And you see here the MCV, MCH that were low on the other more vegan clients that are, you know, premenopausal women. Uh, these are much higher. And so this individual is able to deliver uh, oxygen to his working skeletal muscle, has good exercise tolerance. Now, this is a, another client who's an omnivore, uh, very metabolically healthy, eats red meat, also does intermittent fasting, time restricted feeding, and, and all, all of the like. And you see here, again, a nice healthy level. Uh, MCV, MCH are, are quite high. You see the hematocrit, 44.2%, hemoglobin, 14.8. Right in the sweet spot where we don't have thick viscous blood, but we have enough 
of the iron containing uh, portion of red blood cells, uh, hemoglobin that can help deliver oxygen to working skeletal muscle. So in men, this is where we like to see it. Again, there's a U-shaped curve. More is not always better. If you have a hematocrit at 49% and a hemoglobin at 18%, you might want to start donating blood. And so that's important to recognize. But going back to the 30-year-old vegan who had been vegan for about two years, you know, there's this theory on the internet uh, going around that if you go plant-based, it's the best thing you can do for her heart. But as, as we look here, let's just talk about the HDL cholesterol because this is actually uh, important to recognize. The HDL cholesterol is not as high as you might think provided that she's eating just basically plants, you know, a lot of nuts and seeds and uh, grains and vegetables. The HDL cholesterol is around 50. Now that's better than some, but for women generally, you would see that higher if they were optimizing cardiovascular health. Now what is good here is the VLDL cholesterol was only nine, so that's good. Remember, this individual had a hemoglobin A1C of 5.8%. So we were thinking there's evidence of prediabetes, but because the VLDL is quite low, that's promising. Now, carrying on here, we see the C-reactive protein is 0.42. So ideally, this is under one, and that's where this is for this individual. So not alarming, not worried about chronic inflammation. Again, this individual is very physically active, which is good. Everything related to thyroid is functioning properly. Uh, you look at the TSH, the T3, T4, and so forth. Now, the fasting insulin or relative fasting insulin, remember, I told her to have her normal morning uh, coffee tea, and she had a matcha tea with a little bit of, of whole milk this particular day, along with some honey, uh, an insulin at 7.5. Not worried about that. Ideally, that would be closer to four or five. But again, she had a little bit of honey. And we, if we look at the vitamin D here at 44.9 nanograms per ml, ideally that would be closer to 60. So she's working on getting that up. And so that's good. But what is a little bit concerning is the fibrinogen activity here at 326 milligrams per DL. Now, this is not on the upper end of normal, but higher than what you would ideally like to see because this is related to clotting cascades in the body. So for comparison, I am about 10 years older than this individual. Mine hovers around 179 milligrams per DL. So it's, it's almost half of what this is. So, you know, that was just something that we had spoken about, making sure she's not sitting for extended periods of time, making sure she's hydrated, possibly increasing mushrooms in the diet, walking after meals and, and all of those things. But again, it's not alarming, just something to be aware of because of the fact that there appears to be some evidence of cardiovascular risk, at, at least in insofar as the ApoB to A1 ratio is a little skewed. Again, this is on page one of the blood work cheat sheet. You can't just rely on LDL cholesterol. You need to look at your apolipoprotein B to A1 ratio. So let's look at that right now. Her ApoB uh, is 99. Now that's not alarming milligrams per DL. Again, it's, there's good evidence because her triglycerides are low as well as her VLDL cholesterol and her liver enzymes. So there's not a lot of fat infiltrating throughout the body, but you know, potentially because fibrinogen is a little bit on the higher or slightly high, and then the ApoB is a little bit high here, in relation to the ApoA1. And so that's important to recognize. Again, we want the ratio to be around 0.5. Her ratio is 0.8. And I'm speaking specifically of the ApoB to A1 ratio. If you recall, the ApoA1 is a lipoprotein that's on the exterior surface of the HDL cholesterol. In contrast, ApoB is on the exterior surface of VLDL, IDL, and LDL. And these are the more atherogenic lipoproteins. And in an environment where there's inflammation, insulin resistance, that can increase the oxidation of the VLDL, IDL, and LDL. And so this ratio is closer to one, which is not really what we want. And so my recommendations for this individual is re remove refined sugars from the diet. This person, you know, she likes sweets. She'll have bread periodically. She might have a little bit of ice cream at night and her occupation requires her to sit and drive extensively. So we talked a lot about, okay, when you drive to your clients, she's an occupational therapist, park farther away, make sure you're getting some walks in between these prolonged uh, driving sessions. Make sure you're compressing your feeding window, fasting for 12 to 14 hours per day, minimizing sweets and carbohydrates and some of the refined sweets that she likes to enjoy uh, before bed and making sure that she's given herself three to four hours between her last meal and bedtime. And so, and also because the hemoglobin hematocrit MCV MCH were low, as well as the ferritin and iron were low, probably start consuming more liver several days per week, having more red meat. And she was open 
after seeing these labs and also experiencing mild exercise intolerance to the idea that perhaps she might need to make some dietary choices. And if an individual was not open to dietary choices, then I would recommend dietary supplements. Uh, iron, B12, folate, possibly liver extract if they're open to that, and so on. But I also want to mention, and this is on page two of the blood work cheat sheet, the albumin to creatinine ratio in the urine. As I mentioned several years ago, this person uh, had told me that she had evidence of prediabetes, and this was when she was going to get her master's degree. She ran some labs as part of that, and uh, they said that she has prediabetes. She's trying to find those labs. I don't know exactly what test. I'm sure it's a hemoglobin A1C that indicated that. But we look here. Here's the good news is if she was pre-diabetic five years ago and she didn't make lifestyle changes, there might be indication of other consequences therein within the body, the liver, the kidneys, and all that. But we're not seeing that, which is great, because her albumin to creatinine ratio is less than 10. And what happens is the microvessels can become damaged from the insulin resistance and the elevated glucose levels. And what happens there within the kidneys is that can cause porousness within those vessels and the glomeruli, and that can cause subclinical kidney damage. But thankfully, we're not seeing evidence of that. So uh, this is another test that I recommend if you have a history of diabetes and, you know, knowing that your kidneys are starting to become damaged is just helpful uh, to catalyze lifestyle change. If people are like, ah, oh, these chips, these cookies, these crackers, the ice cream, it's no big deal. I, I like these things, it's okay. Who cares if my hemoglobin A1C is high? But if you can show people, well, your kidneys are actually starting to suffer as a result of this and uh, poor kidney health is linked with all these other consequences from a disease risk standpoint, that can help to catalyze the lifestyle change. But again, in this case, we're not seeing evidence of that, which is really helpful. So when you start to see the albumin, and again, this is urine, this is not in the serum. When you start to see albumin leaking through uh, the kidneys, that shows kidney damage most oftentimes from uh, hyperglycemia and poor metabolic health. It can also be from heavy metal exposure, lead, arsenic, cadmium, mercury, all of that. But um, we do see in this particular case, again, that is, is not happening. So this is really good news. Uh, we're waiting on the APO. Uh, e genotype to see what her risk would be for developing potentially dementia and, and Alzheimer's disease risk. But uh, again, my interpretation for her was minimize sugar consumption. There's pretty good evidence to suggest that she's metabolically healthy, triglycerides fasting at 50, which is great. Um, but also starting to increase red meat consumption several days per week, possibly liver. Uh, if not, then desiccated liver extracts and um, B12 and folate. Now, uh, what we would expect to see over 90 days, and maybe we'll check back with you all and rerun these labs, is that her exercise tolerance will improve. She'll have more energy. Um, possibly less energy changes around menses when she's bleeding and all of that. So I think this is just Again, I want you to be aware of these common findings and trends that are often presented in people who go plant-based for the environment or for their health or because they don't want animals to die for their food consumption. But uh, it is important to recognize that a healthy, wholesome-based, omnivorous-style diet uh, is reflected by better metabolic and, and aerobic capacity in people. So this is kind of, again, uh, clinicians see this all the time. If you're running labs, you, it's, it's really easy to see a client who's been vegan. And uh, so I, I present this to you because there's a big push to go plant-based, to minimize consumption of omnivorous style diets and animal products. But again, you see these reflections in the labs. Um, I do actually just want to look at her creatinine because I actually see low creatinine quite common. So if you look at her creatinine, it's only 0.81 milligrams per DL. I usually see this again in vegan and vegetarian clients. Her creatinine is quite low. Um, in, in omnivorous style individuals who weight lift, usually this is 1.1, 1.2. So that's another um, a proxy that I look at. Um, there's really no ideal creatinine level. Um, some doctors get freaked out if their creatinine is 1.2 and they might say, don't take creatine or don't eat this. Really, it has to do with how much lean muscle mass they have. Of course, an elevated creatinine can be uh, a reflection of chronic kidney disease, but we're not seeing that in, in this case or, or, or often we don't see that in people who are just eating red meat and lifting weights. But um, a creatinine closer to 0 0.8, 0 0.7, Again, I usually see this in people who are under eat protein, and uh, we're, we're seeing that right here. So I, I do like people's creatinine. 
um, to be around one. And, and that's not always common, especially people who don't lift weights, who under eat protein. So anyway, hopefully you found this helpful. I know we kind of went through a lot here. Uh, if you want to learn more, you can download the blood work cheat sheet for free. You just have to opt into the email list. And then of course, if you even want to dive deeper, we have the full blood work masterclass that I will link in the description below. Hopefully you found this helpful. Thanks for sharing this video. Thanks for hitting the like button and we will catch you on a future video down the road.